الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم بخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وَنَزَّلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ تِبِيَانًا لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ وَهُدًا وَرَحْمَةً وَبُشْرًا لِلْمُسْلِمِينَ صدق الله العظيم We begin with Allah's blessed name We praise Him and we glorify Him as He ought to be praised and glorified And we pray this night for Peace and for blessings on all his noble messengers And in particular on the last of them all The blessed Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam As we assemble here in Masjid al-Ghufran In Tamantun, Dr. Ismail in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia To begin tonight, it's the first lecture of what I hope will be several attempts at the subject. The Sufi, the Salafi, and Akhiru Zaman. And I want to begin by drawing attention to the fact whether you are in Surabaya in Indonesia or you are in Tirana in Albania or you are in uh, United States or Japan all around the world today the evidence is very plain and clear that we are located at perhaps the most dangerous moment in all of history so far that there has never been in human history a more dangerous moment than this moment now and I plead for those who are asleep to wake up for tomorrow it might be too late if Israel attacks Iran which can happen at any time then it should not be difficult for us to recognize that such an attack is most likely to lead to a series of events which will culminate in nuclear war and that nuclear war is likely to be waged primarily between the NATO alliance in fact, it should be called the Zionist NATO Alliance and the Russian-led alliance. If that nuclear war takes place, North America and Europe primarily, I believe, and I can be wrong, is going to be devastated and millions maybe tens of millions are going to die 
the world is going to be very different after the first nuclear war in human history. That war will be waged because the Zionists are provoking it. And the Zionists are provoking it, they are pig-headed in their obsession in pursuing a certain goal of ruling the world of establishing their political and economic dominion over all of mankind so that Israel might become the ruling state in the world succeeding the United States of America from where has Imran Hussein got this analysis I've got it from Ilmu Akhiru Zaman that's where I got it from and we don't have long to wait to determine whether this description of events which are now about to occur is accurate or not the same Imran Hussein and I'm not mentioning my name in pride when I billah min hadha any scholar who has pride Allah will take away his knowledge the same Imran Hussein who 15 years ago warned that the US dollar is going to collapse those who know me for the last 15, 16, 17 years would know that I am speaking the truth that the US dollar is going to collapse and that it's going to bring down the American economy that it is going to bring down all the bogus and utterly fraudulent and haram let me repeat it three four times haram 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 paper money and there is going to be chaos in the world and we are now at the doorstep of that because if an attack is launched on, on Iran within hours the price of oil is going to be rising phenomenally is that so difficult to understand? and a phenomenal price rise in the price of oil and of gold spells death for the US dollar where did I get this knowledge from? I ask you tonight was it an angel that was whispering to me 15, 16, 17 years ago that this is going to happen to the US dollar? no I got it from my study of Islamic eschatology Ilmu Akhir zaman and so I plead today with the Ummah of Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam to listen listen we are living in Akhiru Zaman we are living at a very dangerous moment in our history when Israel is going to attempt to replace the United States as the next ruling state in the world is this the time for us to be divided and fighting with each other the Sufi with the Salafi and the Salafi with the Sufi when Allah commanded in the Quran hold fast all of you to the rope of Allah and do not be 
disunited. We cannot unite the whole Ummah. But we can try to unite those whose hearts are in the right place. Is this Akhirul Zaman? The angel came, Jibra'il alayhi salam, at the very last stage of the life of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam and came in the form of a human being into the masjid in front of everybody is this not divine wisdom at work that Allah should send Jibra'il alayhi salam as a human being in plain view of everybody and the angel asked the five questions Two of which pertain to Akhiru Zaman. And the last question was, Tell me, O Muhammad, Sallallahu Ta'ala Alayhi Wasallam, what are the alamatu sa'a? What are the signs of the last hour of Akhiru Zaman? And did he not say, that you will find the naked, barefooted shepherds. Naked, barefooted, so they're poor. They're poor. <laughs> and they will be competed, competing in the construction of tall buildings. I wonder where they're going to get the money from. Is it a bank loan? Are the banks going to finance it? Huh? The naked, barefooted shepherds will compete with each other in the construction of tall buildings. And so when you see the skyscrapers appear in Manhattan, and then from Manhattan, the skyscrapers are spreading all over the world. And then this one says, I'm going to build the tallest one of all. Was it KLCC? And then that one says, no, I'm going to build a taller one. And then Dubai came, came along and says, I'm going to beat all of you. And now Jinda says, wait, you'll see. Huh? Is this not sufficient evidence for the Ummah of Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam that you are living in Akhirul Zaman and that the resources of the world, the wealth, are now in the hands of foolish people? people who waste and squander wealth in the pursuit of PR projects, public relations projects, to inflate their ego? Yes, there is evidence, startling evidence. Well then, how come we are not paying attention to the subject? of ilmu akhiru zaman when the tall buildings are there did he not say sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam that in akhiru zaman women will be dressed and would yet be naked did he not say that what more are you waiting for to recognize that you are living in Akhiru Zaman. Did he not say, can you sense my frustration? That women will dress like men <laughs> with the jacket and the trousers. Lots of them now in blue jeans. I call them the blue jeans jamat. <laughs> Hijab on top, blue jeans below. 
that women would dress like men even with a tie and that men would dress like women when men start dressing like women the loss of, loss of manhood <laughs> what more evidence do we need that we are living in Akhir zaman in Akhir zaman Dajjal wants to impersonate the true Messiah, Nabi Muhammad, Nabi Isa alayhi salam. Did the Prophet not say, sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa salam, that Nabi Isa alayhi salam will return? Yes, he did. And that when he comes back, he is going to come back in the capacity of Hakim, one who rules, and Hakim al Adil, one who rules with justice. When he comes back, there can be no rival to his rule. No! The Security Council of the United Nations cannot impose their authority over Nabi Isa alayhi salam. No, you must be nuts. And so when he comes back, his will be the supreme power, the supreme rule in the world. Is this so difficult to understand? And this is what Dajjal wants to do because he wants to impersonate the true Messiah. If Dajjal is to rule the world, he has to do it from Jerusalem in order to convince Banu Israel that he is indeed Al Masih. He has to do it from a Jerusalem which is the capital of the holy state of Israel. So he'll have to establish an Israel and claim that this is holy Israel. And he'll have to make that Israel the ruling state in the world. And so when you see a state of Israel created in the Holy Land in 1948, more than 60 years ago, here is evidence, startling evidence, that Dajjal is on his way in pursuit of his mission and that you are living in Akhir Zaman is it not time to wake up? and when you see that state of Israel over the last 60 years constantly growing in power and influence to such an extent that today Israel controls the American Congress not Obama if Obama is listening to me today he will shake his head and says Imran is correct it is the Congress that controls not the president not the American armed forces and the Zionists control the Congress on behalf of the state of Israel and so when you see that state of Israel poised to replace the United States of America as a ruling state in the world, is it not time to recognize that you are living in Akhir zaman We are living today in a world in which there is more facade. Be careful of that word. Because facade is in the Quran. 
Fasad is of different kinds. Fasad is that which corrupts and destroys. And there is, the Quran speaks of agricultural fasad. Corrupting food, destruction of food. The Quran speaks of sexual fasad. Sodom and Gomorrah. Hmm? The Quran speaks of many different kinds of fasad. Perhaps the most dangerous one of all is fasad in money. Yes. Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam spoke about riba. And one form of riba is borrowing and lending money on interest, money. And so the money lender was cursed by Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam. He cursed all four and he said they are all equally guilty. The one who takes riba, the one who gives riba, the one who records the transaction and the two witnesses. And the very last revelation to come down in the Quran was one in which Allah declared war on the moneylender. فَأَذَنُوا بِحَرْبٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِ And Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam waging war on the money lender. But the Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wasallam prophesied that the time will come when you will not be able to find even one person, not one, in all of mankind who will not be consuming riba. And if anyone were to claim that he is not consuming riba, verily the dust of riba would be upon him. Verily the vapor of riba would reach him. Are we not living today in a world in which the money lender controls the economy? It is called the bank. Is there not riba all around us today? And therefore the curse of Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam all around. What more evidence do we need that this is akhiru zaman? But there is another form of riba. If you meet a man coming to the market and you'll get all of these ahadith in my book on the back entitled The Prohibition of Riba in the Quran and Sunnah. It's also on my website. If you meet a man coming to the market to sell his goods, truckload of durian, and you buy his durian, I don't think people in France will know what is durian, and the Pakistanis won't know what is durian, but in Southeast Asia it's called the king of all fruits. It's a fruit. And you buy his durians from him before he could enter into the market. And when he enters the market, he realizes he could have gotten a better price in the market. Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam said, that's riba. The Americans have a pretty phrase to describe it. The Americans say, you ripped him off. A transaction based on deception through which you get a gain or a profit to which you are not justly entitled a ripoff today we have abandoned the Quran whether you are Sufi or whether you are Salafi it makes no difference we have abandoned the Sunnah whether you are Sufi or whether you are Salafi, it makes no difference. So you better listen to your brother Imran. And we have accepted that the enemy could make haram what Allah made halal and that is shirk. Allah made the dinar halal. 
Allah made the dirham halal. It is in the Quran. Both the Sufi and the Salafi better go to the Quran and find it. And today the International Monetary Fund has made it haram. Dr. Mahathir didn't know that. He was surprised to find that the Articles of Agreement of the International Monetary Fund, the Zionist International Monetary Fund, prohibit the use of gold as money. And all the Ummah of Muhammad والسلام, whether you're Sufi or whether you're Salafi, it made no difference. We all accepted that they could make haram what Allah made halal. And we are stuck with the paper. And the paper is haram, haram, haram. Which Sufi scholar has declared it is haram? You can probably count with your fingers how many there are. Which Salafi scholar has declared it is haram? You could probably count with your fingers of one hand if there are any. I hope that there are some inshallah, but I may not have heard about them. This is riba. As the paper money falls in value, you are ripped off. Wait until the US dollar collapses and you see what's going to happen in the world. And so here is evidence, startling evidence, that there is facade in the economy. Not just agricultural facade with genetically modified food. Not, less, not just electronic facade with the radiation from cell phones damaging the male chromosomes so that tomorrow no baby boy is going to be born. And so the prophecy will be fulfilled that one man would have to maintain 50 women. That's Akhiru Zaman. Not just political facade, and I wish I had the time to explain the political facade, but facade in the economy as well. Facade everywhere you turn. What is it that explains this universal facade? The Quran tells us, Inna ya'juja wa ma'juja mufsiduna fil up. That Gog and Magog are PhDs in Fasad. And when Allah releases them, Hatta iza futi hat ya'juju wa ma'juj. Wahum in kulli hadabin yan silun. They're going to spread in all directions. And they will bring universal facade to the world. And so I have spent half an hour, which is too much time, I should not have spent so much time, providing the evidence. And there is so much more that we are living in Akhiru Zaman. And this is the time, this is the age of the greatest fitna that mankind will experience from the time of Adam alayhi salam to the last day. And so this is the time for us to be closing our ranks, to be living as a brotherhood with love for each other, to be building our power, internal power and external power, and it is time to end this warfare. Salafis waging war on the Sufis. And Sufis waging war on the Salafis. What we plan to do is to define who is the Salafi. And define who is the Sufi. And to suggest how is it possible for the Sufi and the Salafi to come together to live as brothers and to jointly confront the enemy who is waging war on us. 
to define the Salafi is easy. He says, I want to live the way of life of the Aslaf, the early Muslims. And the Prophet said, Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam, the best generation is mine. And then the one that comes after me. And then the one that comes after me. These three generations are referred to as the Aslaf. And the Salafi says, I want to return to the way of life of the Aslaf. This is something to be respected. This is something to be admired. This is something to be applauded. Particularly when Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam warned about Akhiru Zaman. You shiku hadith of Tirmizi. You shiku ayati ala nasi zaman. It will not be long before that time will come. La yabqa min al Islam illa smu. When nothing will remain of Islam but the name. Wala yabqa min al Quran illa smu. And when nothing will remain of the Quran but the traces of the writing. مَسَاجِدُهُمْ عَامِرَةٌ وَهِيَ خَرَابُ مِنَ الْهُدَى In that age, آخِرُ الزَّمَانِ The masajid are going to be grand structures but devoid of guidance. وَلَمَاءُهُمْ And the ulama of those people at that time the religious scholars of Islam. Sharrun nasi mimman tahta adim is sama. Min indihim tahrujul fitna. Wafihim ta'ud. Will be the worst people beneath the sky. From them will emerge that which will be fitna. And they will become the centers of fitna, corrupting the people, bringing about divisions, disunity, a betrayal of the deen. And so the Salafi says, I don't want to go that way. I want to return to the original deen. And this is something commendable. When you go to the true Salafi, when you go to the Jama'ah of the true Salafi, to the extent that they are faithfully following the Aslaf, you will see something of how they used to live at that time. But I ask the Salafi, did the Aslaf use paper money? I don't think so. <laughs> no, I think they'll take the paper money and throw it in the toilet. Did the Aslaf go and vote for an Islamic political party fighting elections under a modern constitution of a modern state which declares that sovereignty no longer belongs to Allah. That's Egypt. That's Tunisia. That's Libya. That's Turkey. That sovereignty now belongs to the state. And you are going to fight in elections after Mubarak has been removed in conditions that are very suspicious. And you are now going to make enter into a marriage with the Egyptian armed forces? And you say you are Salafi? Is this the way of life of the Aslaf? Or should you not be struggling to restore the Khilafah? 
struggling to restore Darul Islam. And so, yes, it is commendable that you should try to restore the way of life of the Aslaf. But I think you need a little help because you're not seeing what we are seeing. You are blind. You are blind to the traps which have been laid for you in the modern age. You are following the Aslaf externally. Why don't you look at the Aslaf internally? Did the Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam not say? And my teacher of blessed memory, Maulana Dr. Muhammad Fadlur Rahman Ansari rahimahullah, taught us when we were students in Pakistan in Karachi at the Alimia Institute of Islamic Studies. That's where I learned from him. And he repeated this hadith so often. The Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam warned. He said, Itta kufira satal mu'min. Fa innahu yanzuru bi nurillah. Fear the firasa. That wisdom. That wisdom which comes from internal, intuitive, spiritual insight. Fear the firasa of the mu'min. For when he sees, he sees with the nur of Allah. And that is Sufi. That is Tasawwuf. And it is time for the Sufis to be reminded about that. Because they are also using the same paper money. <laughs> and they are also voting in elections. Every election they are there voting. And yet they say, we have the right Islam, and those fellows, they are wrong. Hmm? What is Sufism? We have just another two minutes to introduce the subject of what is Sufism. The angel came and asked five questions. You remember, number five was the alamat to sa'a, the signs of the last day. But question one was, what is Islam? And question two was, what is Iman? And then question three was, what is Al-Ihsan? And we heard an answer we never heard before. First time we ever heard this. When the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, that Al-Ihsan is, an ta'abud Allah ka'annaka tarah. That you should worship Allah, that you should serve Allah as though you were seeing Him. But it is not possible to see Him with these eyes. Lan tarani, says Allah in the Quran. Lan tarani, not with these eyes, you can never see me. But yes, with the heart you can see. Fainaha. La ta'amal absar, says Allah in the Quran. It's not these eyes that are blind. Walakin ta'amal kulubu allati fi sudur. What is blind is the heart which is inside your chest. When faith enters into the heart, then nur enters into the heart. And then the heart can see what otherwise cannot be seen. That is Sufism. That is Tasawwuf. And that is the highest stage of religion. Personally, I wish the word Sufism had never been invented. My life would have been easier. Though we never had the word Tasawwuf, my life would have been easier. All that we needed is Al-Ihsan. To be able to see with the heart that worships Allah what otherwise cannot be seen. 
Let us now interrupt for the Azan of Isha. Bismillahi awwaluhu wa akhiru. I wish that the word tasawwuf had never been invented. That the word Sufism, which is an English word, had never been invented. Life would have been easier. We didn't need this terminology when we had the word Al-Ihsan. Al-Ihsan is to worship Allah and to serve Allah as though you are seeing Him with the eye of your heart. فَإِن لَمْ تَكُنْ تَرَحْ فَإِنَّهُ يَرَحْ If you have not reached that stage as yet where you can see with the internal eye and worship Him, then at least this, you should recognize that He is seeing you. And so, the heart can see. But the heart can only see when there is faith. And the heart can see only when there is noor in the heart. And in Ayatun Noor, which is Ayat number 35 of Surah Noor, Surah number 24, Allah says, بَعْدَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ يَهْدِ اللَّهُ لِنُورِهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ Allah guides to his nur whomsoever Allah chooses. So it is Allah to choose. <laughs> no, we can't choose. There is no way by which we can learn and get the nur. It is when Allah she chooses a servant, he will give to that servant nur. And with that nur he'll be able to see what otherwise cannot be seen? Ittaku firasat al mu'min fa innahu yanzuru bin nurillah. And Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam warns, he warns, he warns. Fear the firasa, the wisdom built on internal intuitive spiritual insight. Fear the firasa of that mu'min. Fear it. Who when he sees, he sees with the nur of Allah. What is the status of that nur? Let me take the discussion one step further. And what an important step it is. In Sahih Bukhari, Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam made this startling statement. He said that Nabuwa or prophethood is comprised of 46 different parts. And he said after me nothing remains of Nabuwa or prophethood in the world except one part and so there is one part of Nabuwa still remaining in the world what is that one part of Nabuwa still remaining in the world he said it is Ru'ya Ru'ya Sadiqa Ru'ya Saliha Ru'ya is that which the heart sees And so there is knowledge Which comes And is still coming to this day Through that one last part of Nabuwa still remaining in the world. The Sufi has to be reminded. Yes. 
the Sufi, our brother, the Sufi has to be reminded. That when you see with the nur of Allah, then you can be blessed with ru'ya, vision, insight. Every scientist in the world knows that all major discoveries in science came after you had done your homework through insight. Insight. And if we had that insight, if we had that ru'ya, then as Sufis you would have been able to recognize that the paper that you have in your wallet and that you are using to buy and to sell, it is shaitan who gave it to you. <laughs> And Shaitan was working and he was also drawing overtime pay. Shaitan was working for Dajjal. And the paper money that you have in your pocket is Dajjal's money in your pocket. And so it's time to wake up. If you say you are Sufi, it's time to wake up and ask well, how come I was taken for a ride? How come I never recognized what was happening in the world of money? How come I never recognized what was happening in the political system? That the Khilafah state was replaced by this godless creature built on shirk which says that sovereignty no longer belongs to Allah. He is not Al-Malik. The state is now Al-Malik. How come we didn't see that? And you went and you voted in elections for Tom, Dick and Harry and Benazir and Khalida and whosoever they were. Like cattle! And you're fighting with the Salafi saying, we are the Sufi. Is it not time to wake up and stop the fighting? The Salafi, however, now we have to turn to a more difficult part of the subject. The Salafi insists that there is no new knowledge of the deen. No that we are not allowed to interpret anything in the Quran and anything in the Ahadith differently from that which has come to us from Allah and His Messenger and from the Aslaf. And that is a difficult stumbling block. And when we make it critical comment on the Salafis and I hope the Sufis are listening to me notice that I don't do it with boxing gloves I always say that these are my brothers and if I have to correct my brothers I have to do it with love even if I have to use harsh language with Tabliq Jamaat or Jamaatul Tabliq to wake them up. I'm using the language because these are my brothers and I love them. And I want to wake them up to save them from the danger in which they are living and the direction in which they are moving. And so I plead with the Sufis that if you have to offer critical comments about your Salafi brothers, do it in such a way that you will not divide the Ummah. That they will not have an excuse to say you're waging war on them. No. We are doing this in the spirit of the pursuit of truth. 
and recognize that you are our brothers. Maybe that in the process the Salafi will one day become a Sufi because the Aslaf were people of Al-Ihsan and so if a Salafi is indeed a true Salafi he will one day become a Sufi meaning people of Al-Ihsan this is a serious problem of methodology and we say to the Salafi and we've been saying it for all this time all these months in our lectures that no brother you are around there are verses of the Quran which could not be understood no by the Aslaf and Nabi Muhammad alayhi salam did not provide the explanation. And today we are the ones who have to use knowledge and insight to recognize what Allah is saying. And when we provide that interpretation of the Quran, notice my brother Salafi, that the overwhelming majority of the people are accepting our explanation as correct. Here is an example. And I have spoken about this so many times. Here is a verse in Surah Al-Ma'idah. In which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Ba'ad'a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani r-rajim Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu O you who have faith in Allah La tattakhidu al-yahuda wa al-nasara awliya Do not take the Jews And do not take the Christians As your friends and allies Is Allah speaking about all Jews and all Christians? Or is he speaking about some Jews and some Christians? You have to go to the rest of the Quran to answer that question. And I don't have the time now to take you to all those verses of the Quran, but there are several lectures of mine. When you go to the rest of the Quran, it is plain and clear Allah is not speaking about all Jews and all Christians. No! He's speaking about some Jews and some Christians, not all. Well then, who is he speaking about? The answer is there in the words which follow. Ba'aduhum awliya uba. Which means, do not take such Jews and do not take such Christians as your friends and allies who themselves are friends and allies of each other. Ba'aduhum awliya uba. The Quran is anticipating. Uh, I don't know the Bahasa for anticipate. Come on, help me. All right. You don't have that in Bahasa. <laughs> the Quran is saying that this is an event which is to come. When a Jewish Christian alliance, friendship and alliance is going to emerge. When that Jewish fresh Christian alliance emerges, you Muslims are prohibited from being their friends and allies. And if you become their friends and allies, then what is the price that you will pay? Whosoever from amongst you turn to them for friendship and alliance, you now belong to them, you've lost your Islam. You now belong to them, you have lost your Islam. 
Surely Allah will not provide guidance for a people whose trademark is zulum. A people who oppress a wicked people, an unjust people. This explanation of the ayah which I have just given is new. It's new. It's not there in the time of the Salaf, the Aslaf. But because it was not there in the time of the Aslaf, does it mean that I don't have the right to interpret the Quran as I've just done? The answer is that the overwhelming majority of those who have heard this explanation have accepted it. And so it's time for you to wake up. Your methodology is defective. So many of our people today who are Salafi are joining with NATO. NATO is the Zionist NATO military alliance working on behalf of Israel working on behalf of the Judeo-Christian Alliance, the Zionist Alliance, NATO. And yet you come with an Islamic movement in Libya and you make an alliance with NATO to overthrow the Libyan government. And then you want to argue with me that Gaddafi was a dictator, he was this, he was that, he was this, he was that, he was this, he was that. Stop wasting my time, you fool! I have to use this harsh language because you've lost your Islam. You don't even know that. You are so blind, you don't even know you've lost your Islam. When you reach in your grave, you remember me. This is the Quran. And they're doing the same thing in Syria now. Yes. If you want to remove the Syrian government, this is not the way to do it. To make an alliance with the Zionists. Huh? Turkey has a government which says it is Islamic. Pro-Islam. But that government is very comfortable with NATO. And that government is working over time for NATO. And you want to come to tell me that you are representing Islam? I don't have dust in my eyes. I can see you for what you are. You are tools of NATO, the Turkish government. And so your, def your methodology is defective. And now we turn to another verse of the Quran in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it is in Surah Al-Anbiya. وَحَرَامٌ عَلَىٰ قَرْيَةٍ أَهْلَكْنَاهَا أَنَّهُمْ لَا يَرْجِعُونَ Allah speaks about a town, a city, which he destroyed. And the people were expelled. And Allah placed a ban on them that they could never return to reclaim that town as their own. Tabule. Hatta. Until they will return to reclaim the town. When? When? Iza futihat ya'juju wa ma'jud. When Gog and Magog are released. وَهُمْ مِنْ كُلِّ حَدَبٍ يَنْسِلُونَ And they spread out in all directions with their facade. But they're not only people of facade. Hadith al-Qudsi, Sahih Muslim. I have created creatures of mine so powerful that not but I can destroy them. Not but I can wage war with them. Hmm? These are Gog and Magog, Yajuj and Majuj. 
we have interpreted the, this verse of the Quran and we have declared that this town is Jerusalem this is the heart of this book Jerusalem in the Quran the heart of this book is that the town is Jerusalem this book became a bestseller 10 11 years ago and after 11 years it is still a bestseller and it is translated into a probably about a dozen languages by now the overwhelming majority of Muslims today who have heard this interpretation have accepted it but this is not there in early Islam no when we recognize that the town is Jerusalem we know that Allah is speaking about Banu Israel that he destroyed Jerusalem he expelled Banu Israel he placed a ban on them and for 2,000 years they could not return to reclaim Jerusalem as their own and yet today they have returned and they have taken control of Jerusalem what is the explanation we ask our Salafi brothers and they are our brothers how many times must I repeat it Imran Hussein is not waging war on you no Imran Hussein loves you you my brothers and Imran Hussein wants to unite the Ummah what's wrong with that 2000 years after Jerusalem was destroyed Banu Israel was expelled 2000 years later they returned and they are now taking control of Jerusalem and the Quran says of itself that it is tibyanan li kulli shay it explains all things I ask you what is the explanation in the Quran for the return of the Jews to the Holy Land to Jerusalem to reclaim it as their own 2000 years after Allah had expelled them and I say to you brother this is the explanation in Surah Al-Anbiya and the overwhelming majority of the Ummah is accepting this explanation you being left behind all that I'm asking you to do is to look again at your methodology and recognize that there is new knowledge that comes and with that new knowledge you can understand what previously could not be understood I'm running out of time I would have loved to go on to some more verses of the Quran but I have to go to the ahadith before we can end I don't want the Imam to stop me before I give you some ahadith the Prophet said sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam the Dajjal will ride on a donkey the donkey would travel as fast as the clouds the donkey will have his ears stretched out wide we have interpreted the hadith to say that that donkey is already here that flying donkey is already here it's the modern aircraft and the overwhelming number of Muslims out there who listen accept that this is correct but you insist because this was not expressed by the Aslaf you insist as Salafi with this defective methodology that you have to wait for the flying donkey brother you're waiting in vain 
And I speak, I'm using the first person now. I'm speaking to you with love wherever you are in the world. Your methodology is defective. The Sufi methodology recognizes insight, recognizes the ca capacity to see with nur and therefore to provide a new explanation. That's the Sufi methodology. And I got that from my teacher, who was a Sufi sheikh. I'm going to come back to that in a moment, inshallah. The Prophet said one more hadith, just one more. There's so many more, but only one more. I know you would enjoy if I were to take so many verses of the Quran and so many hadith, but look at the time. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam, Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, that the river Euphrates will uncover a mountain of gold. A mountain rises high up in the sky. Mountain is not a hill. A mountain high, rises high up in the sky. And so a mountain of gold is going to be a large amount of gold rising high up in the sky and coming out of the river. We have interpreted this using insight. And whenever we offer an interpretation, we say Allah knows best. Allah knows best. So our interpretation should not be a cause for fighting and disunity. No. You can differ with me and yet we are still brothers. I say that, he said that the believers must not touch that gold. So that wakes me up to the fact, this is symbolism. The believers must not touch that gold. A mountain of gold coming out of the river Euphrates. And he said that people are going to fight over that gold and 99 out of every 100 would be killed. I say that mountain of gold has already come. And the word mountain here is not literal. The word mountain here symbolizes a large quantity. And it is not the metal of gold, but oil. Oil. And that oil has already come. <laughs> the last hundred years have been the years of that oil. From that oil basin by the river Euphrates. But why would he describe oil as gold? You need insight here. The answer is that that oil has functioned as gold. For the last 40 years, since September 1971, while the ulama of Islam have been eating roti chanai and drinking tartaric. If you have tears to weep, weep. Because he is telling us that that oil is going to be used to function as gold. And that is what happened these last 40 years. The US dollar could never have survived. Could never have done all the wickedness that it did these last 40 years. If the US dollar had not become a petrodollar. What is a petrodollar? A petrodollar is oil functioning as gold. Gold is money. 
Gold is money with intrinsic value. Oil has intrinsic value. So in 1971, uh, this is going to take me 15 minutes to explain, so let me not do it. <laughs> the US dollar became a petrodollar. Maybe some other time I'll explain to you what happened with King Faisal with, with the oil boycott in 1973-74, the oil boycott. And how, and I love King Faisal Rahimahullah. The only Saudi king for, who I, for whom I say Rahimahullah. But they were able to fool him. Yes, they fooled him. And he agreed. And then OPEC agreed. That they would sell oil for only US dollars. You cannot buy oil unless you pay for it with US dollars. And that's when the US dollar became a petrodollar. And the US dollar has survived all of these years doing monstrous wickedness in the world. That's why he said don't touch that oil, don't touch that gold. Because the US dollar became a rope around our neck while we were eating roti chanai and drinking teh tari. What will Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam do with both the Sufi and the Salafi who be equally blind? Hmm? I have given you two examples of two ahadiths interpreted for the first time in this way. But more and more people are recognizing this is the correct interpretation. Now one final one. I said I was a student of a Sufi Sheikh. And I love him and I've never hidden the fact, never, that my teacher is a Sufi Sheikh. And I'm proud to have been the student of a Sufi Sheikh. Whosoever is annoyed because of that is free to leave me. Of course, I'm not going to change. I'm proud to be the student of a Sufi Sheikh. Maulana Dr. Muhammad. Fadlur Rahman Ansari Rahimahullah And it is because of the training that I got from him That I am blessed today to do the work that I am doing The Sufi Sheikh But why do I no longer I no longer Declare I am Sufi Why? You never hear me saying that Why? I'll tell you why I do not want to have to answer for Sufi practices which I cannot defend. No. And secondly, I want to plead with the Sufi that if you have a religious practice like we have right here in this masjid after the Salatul Maghrib and we recite all these tazkirat for a long time. If you have a religious practice, which you may have practiced for generations and generations, and you're very comfortable with it, something beneficial, not like drinking whiskey, no. But it is not based on the Quran and Sunnah. No. Even though it is beneficial, it cannot be something that is essential. No. If it is not in the Quran and not in the Sunnah, if the Aslaf did not practice it, it cannot be considered to be essential. Not at all. You can say beneficial, but you cannot say essential. And so I want to now ask, we are living on the brink of a pit of fire. The world is going to be very, very different from what it is today in a short time from now. Are you going to allow these religious practices that your father and your grandfather and your great-grandfather and generations have practiced? But it is not in the Quran, it is not in the Sunnah. Celebrating the birth anniversary of the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, Mawlid. Standing and reciting salams hmm? 
Are you going to allow these religious practices to divide you from your brothers? When they are not essential? What is more important? وَاَتَسِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا It is far more important to preserve the unity of the jama'ah the Sufi and the Salafi than to insist on these religious practices which are not in the Quran and not in the Sunnah so I have said in our Muslim village we will not allow in the masjid any religious practice which is not based on the Quran and the universally recognized Sunnah and we will not allow it in our public life but if I want to do it in my private life that's my business and if you come to attack me for what I do in my private life we will throw you out of our Muslim village faster than Federal Express and I want to suggest this is the formula for unity the Salafi who listens to me and who has his heart in the right place will recognize this is a workable formula for unity the Sufi who listens to me and who has his heart in the right place would recognize that this is a workable platform a workable formula for unity and so now we end by reminding that we are living at a moment of more danger than ever before in our history tomorrow the world is going to be very very different it's time to wake up it's time to unite our ranks and no more fighting between us and so let the Sufi and the Salafi come together as brothers to each other Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka inta sameel alim wa tub alayna ya mulana inna ka inta tawab rahim bi rahmatika ya arham ar rahimin ameen we have time the imam has kindly consented for a few questions so please let's have your questions as soon as possible yes Salam uh, Sheikh you mentioned that uh, you yourself don't refer to yourself as a Sufi anymore. So I just want to extrapolate that. Do you think it's a good advice, given the, the precarious nature of the world, for Muslims not to use these titles, even if you do follow a certain methodology, but to not use the title of Sufi or Salafi personally uh, and just qualify themselves as Muslim? as a first step in avoiding the fitna that you described um, yeah. it will be a dream come true <laughs> if we stop using these titles hmm? the Salafi if he's indeed Salafi will grow to become a Sufi because he'll grow to reach al -Ihsan. there's no need to describe yourself as Salafi the Sufi, if he's indeed a Sufi, would have that ihsan, that capacity to see and would recognize the reality of the world today and therefore the imperative of Muslim unity to unite our ranks. If we get rid of the labels, it will be helpful. My teacher, Mawlana Dr. Fadl Rahman Ansari Rahimahullah used to stand up I don't know where he got the courage from in India and Pakistan they use different terms he said I am not Deobandi and I am not Brelvi and I am not Ahle Hadith and I am not Wahhabi I am a Muslim those are golden words and that's what we need for today any more questions what is the greatest danger of riba? The hellfire. The hellfire. The hellfire. Because Nabi Muhammad cursed 
the one who is he, he, don't mind if I mention it he's working in a bank now but he says I'm going to get out of the job soon <laughs> mashallah 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 the others who are working in banks should follow his example get out of that job you're working for the uh, money lender the money lender has been cursed <laughs> And you're working for the money lender. He cursed all four. The one who takes riba, the one who gives riba, the one who rec records the transaction and two witnesses. And he says they're all equally guilty. The punishment for riba is Jahannam. The other danger of riba, both the money lending, when the money lender lends you money, Sometimes he lends you money because he wants to become rich. <laughs> but when the Zionist lends you money, that's not why he's lending it to you. The primary reason why he's lending money to you is because he wants to enslave you. And he's already enslaved Indonesia. And our daughters, our daughters, and our sisters from Indonesia are now slaves all around the world all around this region, slaves working for a wage that is the wage of a dog oppressed he wants to enslave you that's why he's lending you money on interest he wants to reduce you to a state where you are immobile. You are so poor and destitute that you cannot resist his oppression. No. So riba has been used as an injection that injects poison into you. And when you've been injected with that injection, you become paralyzed. That's the price we pay. The danger of riba. Any more questions? No more questions, okay? Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta samiul alim wa tuba alina ya mulana innaka anta tawab rahim Allahumma anta salamu minka salam tabarak rabbana wa ta'ali tiyadha al-jalali wa al-ikram Sami'ana wa ta'ana gufranaka rabbana wa alayka al-masir wa sallallahu ta'ala ala khayri khalqihi muhammadin wa ala alihi wa ala ashabihi ajma'in bi rahmatika ya rahmatika ya rahmatika I mean after the salat if you want to bring your books for autographs you can bring them to me inshallah